And at one point he asked me, well, listen, Hans, you know so much about chemical weapons. Would you like to write an article for the internal magazine of my ministry? Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. The Chinese army, the Chinese police are advancing through the city from a variety of directions on Tiananmen Square. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Hans de Vray is a Dutch journalist who has worked in Berlin, Brussels, Geneva and Prague. Whilst working at the United Nations in Geneva, Hans was the subject of an attempted recruitment by the KGB to develop an agent of influence to disseminate Soviet points of view. In addition, the KGB analysed targeted journalists in terms of possible blackmail or compromat, compromising material. This especially held true for journalists who might later find themselves in an important position, such as a press spokesman at a ministry. We later talk about Hansi's visit to a Soviet chemical weapons facility and testing ground on the Volga, some 750 kilometres southeast of Moscow, as well as his service in the Dutch Army. If you are enjoying the podcast, please leave a written review in Apple Podcasts or share us on social media. If you can spare it, I'm asking listeners to contribute at least three US dollars per month to help keep us on the air. Larger amounts are welcome too. Plus, you get that sought after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a monthly supporter of the podcast. You also bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Back to today's episode. We welcome Hans to our Cold War conversation. Well, after fulfilling my armed service, I went on to study Russian at university. Um, then uh, got a job at Amnesty International, the Dutch section, which at the time was the, the biggest of them all. And from there, I, I became a, a journalist, um, first working with Dutch International Radio and then quitting and becoming a freelance correspondent in Geneva. Being in Geneva, um, you're looking for just international stories based around the United Nations representation there, yeah? Yes, well, the, the UN office in Geneva is so big and there are so many international organizations there that you have to focus on, on some topics. And with my human rights background, that was the obvious topic to focus on uh, because I was well-versed in the subject. And as a sort of secondary topic, I chose arms control. And at the time, there were, there were nuclear arms talks, uh, chemical weapons talks, uh, some biological weapons still going on. Uh, th- those basically were the two uh, topics I preferred. But obviously, anything that happened there uh, that had to be covered, you covered as well. Right, right. And how did you first come across Mikhail Petrukov? Well, this was a, a very odd uh, thing. Uh, I, at the time, I was looking for a new apartment to rent so I went to this corner in the in this vast UN building where they had advertisements uh, for apartments or anything for rent for sale and I saw a man standing there looking at these advertisements and from behind I thought this must be a Russian <laughs> you know the, I don't know it's hard to explain but the, the type of suit bad shoes bad hairdo um, so I asked in Russian Finally, I had a chance to use my Russian. Excuse me, are you from the Soviet Union? <laughs> and the guy turned around, startled almost. I said, yes, I, I am, yes. And so that's how I got to know him. Now, in retrospect, he could as well have been Romanian or Polish or what have you. 
but I just chose an option and it turned out to be the right option. Right. And then how how did that sort of initial contact with him progress? How what what sort of happened next? What happened next was the contact you had as a journalist with any uh, diplomat, uh, a cup of coffee here, uh, maybe a luncheon there, but mainly you know having coffee and discussing things that were happening at the UN, uh, not nothing in particular. Um, however, what was odd about this man was that uh, officially uh, he was uh, covering UNCTAD, the United Nations uh, a trade development organization. But he knew very little about that, but he knew a lot about arms control, uh, human rights, uh, the war in Afghanistan, and other issues that were at the time on top of the agendas. So that was interesting on the one hand, and on the other hand, slightly strange. Right, right. And do you think that he was looking for you in the first place, or he, he thought that you were possibly useful after he first met you? Um, again, I'm, I'm talking in retrospect uh, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, at the time, it wasn't probably that clear. But in retrospect, uh, he may have been doing all kinds of things, like, uh, can I develop this journalist as a source? Can I develop uh, this journalist as someone who might work for us, Soviet Union? Um, are there things I could do as a journalist that could in later years make him blackmailable, so to speak? Yeah. Um, gathering compromat, as it's called t- these days. Um, but at the time, as I said, it was coffees, and it was a luncheon here and there. And then one day, uh, he took me to a quite expensive restaurant, which for me as a poor freelance journalist was, you know, exceptional. Uh, we, we had a very nice lunch and we chatted about, I don't remember what, but, you know, what was happening at the UN and in the world at large. Uh, and after lunch, uh, the waiter came with the bill and I, you know, sort of, I offered to pay because you have to be polite and all that. But though he insisted and I'll pay, oh, okay, well, if you want to pay, go ahead. And then he paid, and then he did something that no diplomat would ever do. He left a bill on the table when we left. Now, any any diplomat or any uh, businessman in Geneva or whatever would have taken the, the bill with him so he could declare it later as expenses. Because, you know, you have an expense account. You have to present the bills. But he left it on the table. And that was so – I found it uh, – I rem- still clearly remember – I found it so strange that he did that, um, that it sort of put me on guard. And, uh, I, I thought something is wrong here. This, this doesn't fit uh, a normal diplomat. Yeah, because I understand that from your work in the Dutch section of Amnesty International, they'd sort of given you some training about possible hostile activities. Well, training is a big word, but... Uh, <laughs> they would warned you. <laughs> the International was very much aware of attempts by foreign intelligence services to penetrate your organization and get hold of dossiers and, and uh, find out what the organization was up to and, and things like that. So, yes, we, 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 are, we were warned about possible uh, activities of, of intelligence services. Right, but that's that's different than sitting in Geneva with a, a Russian diplomat or a Soviet diplomat uh, and having coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I think he he then did something which which really confirmed to you that he was um, a, a KG. Well, some some intelligence agent for the Soviet Union. That's, that's true. I was very deep into the chemical weapons talks uh, in Geneva at the time, which later led to the establishment of the Chemical Weapons Convention, the, the worldwide ban on chemical weapons. And at one point he asked me, well, listen, Hans, you know so much about chemical weapons. Would you like to write an article for uh, the internal magazine of my ministry? Now, he worked for the Soviet Ministry for Foreign Trade. 
um, and then he then went on to explain that obviously the article would have to be published under his name, not mine, but I would have to write it. Now, I mean, <laughs> you can't have it much stranger than that. I mean, this was highly suspicious. My problem was, I could have said, are you crazy? Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But the guy had given me very useful information. And this is probably also the trick. You, you get something in return. The, the rewards, so to speak. So anyway, so in, in answering this question, I said to myself, well, what can I do? I can make an English language summary of an article that I had already published in the newspaper I worked for in the Netherlands. And so I did. And he, he was very, well, very grateful. Um, and then after a few weeks, um, he invited me again for, uh, for, for dinner this time, again in an expensive restaurant. And after dinner, uh, you know, which is usually the point in time when business is done, uh, over coffee, he pulled out a, a quite large envelope from, from his jacket and handed it to me over the table. And I thought, this is, this is again, so strange. So I waved with my hands in front of me, said, no, I don't need money. Come on. Uh, you know, it was nothing. Um, and th this sort, I mean, this gesture made me somewhat angry because it may have been that there was someone in that restaurant taking pictures of the event. Um, and the picture of you accepting a, an envelope from a Soviet diplomat could be, you know, stored in your KGB or whatever file and could be lifted out of that file again when you would be in a position where you would be susceptible, susceptible to blackmail. Uh, for instance, in my position, I might have become a spokesman at the Dutch Foreign Ministry. Why not? Well, my job... Uh, uh, this, my, oh, sorry, my experience would, would fit the job description. And if at that moment, working for a ministry, someone approaches you and presents that picture and says to you, you wouldn't want to see, you wouldn't want your boss to see this picture, would you? If you then say no, uh, they got you. Uh, because then, you know, you're open, open for, for blackmail. Um so that, that was, I think, the main event where he he proved to be not a diplomat but a spy. Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, the classic uh, compromising the uh, uh, compromising you with with photos like that. Um, he, I mean, he, he sounds quite amateurish in terms of the fact that. You know, he he said to you he was working for foreign trade and then wanted information on chemical weapons. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the it's not the sort of um, KGB we know of the uh, spy films. No, but I mean, obviously, you have agents uh, of all ranks and grades and capabilities, um, and we may come later in this conversation to another spy I I, I knew in Geneva, who was much more uh, capable and sophisticated, uh, Western almost. Not this guy. I mean, he was simple. Uh, um, they, they didn't need... But, you know, I, I wasn't a very important target either. So, you know, I was just a journalist, like, uh, at the time, maybe well, over 100 course, foreign correspondents uh, permanently working at the UN building in Geneva. Um, so... You know, why waste the time of an important asset in your uh, secret service to talk to a, you know, not not that important Dutch journalist? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you compared your story with an American colleague who you'd seen in company of Soviet diplomats. That, that is correct. Uh, I was working at the time in one of the press rooms where each uh, correspondent had a small cubicle. And across from me, there was an, or a few rows across from me, there was an American colleague. Uh, I believe he worked freelance for the New York Times and some other media, who I'd often seen in company of another uh, Soviet diplomat. Um, so after this event at the restaurant and the envelope, I, I asked him 
uh, what his experience was with this Soviet diplomat, and it turned out to be an almost perfect copy of my story. Uh, lunches, dinners, uh, the request to do something for them. Um, and so anyway, and I also went to see the, the chairman or the president of the Association of Foreign Correspondents at the UN, a very seasoned British journalist. And he told me, oh, this happens all the time. This is as old as the road to Rome. I mean, nothing new here. <laughs> and he, he obviously wasn't willing to take any action. <laughs> yeah. It was something very normal, very usual. Yeah. Well, they, they I think spying's described as the second oldest profession in the world. That is absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you decide to, I mean, what, what do you do? Do you just break off all contact with Mikhail oh, I, at this point? No, I didn't, but I, I did. I did want to take revenge in a way. Uh, so at, at the, uh, shortly after this episode, I went to the uh, annual reception for the uh, Russian Revolution, the October Revolution. And I, because I didn't know any uh, high diplomats other than uh, one or two arms control negotiators. And so I looked around at this reception I, and I found someone uh, who looked to be uh, higher up in the hierarchy. And indeed, it turned out to be the one of the first secretaries of the, of the Soviet permanent representation to the UN. And I, you know, like you do at cocktail parties, you, I got to talk with him. And step by step, I told him the story of Mikhail and say, you have to remember, these were the days of Gorbachev and his, you know, his restructuring of Soviet society, the Glasnost and Perestroika. So I told this diplomat that we were very satisfied uh, with the with the new uh, the new course that Moscow had taken, especially in the fields of human rights and arms control. But I said, "What is so strange is that the organs, uh, meaning KGB or GRU, are still so old-fashioned." And I and then went on to explain this story about this my meetings with with uh, uh, Mikhail, and he was very. Well, he was a bit angry. He said, there is no KGB in Geneva, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I, on a bluff, I said, well, that may be, but um, uh, yes, several of my colleagues, I knew of only one, but I presume to have more, uh, several of my colleagues have had the same experience, and we are now considering to lodge a formal complaint um, against your mission um, because of this behavior, this this cannot stand. This this is not permissible. And he, well, he, he sort of waved away this, these these words. And then the day or, or two days after this, uh, Mikhail called me in the in the um, at my desk in in, in the in the Palais des Nations, the UN building, which he rarely did. He he always came by in person. He never called. He just dropped by in person. But he called, and we had coffee. And he said, what did you say? And um, it turned out that this first secretary had called a extraordinary meeting of the Soviet embassy, or permanent representation, to the UN, and said that the journalists in U at the UN are going to complain against us. What is this and all that? And uh, So my story worked in that, in that sense. Uh, and then I, I told him how stupid he had been all this time. The, the bill he forgot to take along, and trying to get me to write something for him, and the attempt to give him uh, to give me a, an envelope. And one of my best friends uh, at the UN Correspondents Association knew the uh, head of police of Geneva, uh, and I told uh, Michael. Uh, I told this to Michael. I said, for me, it's quite easy to have you extradited. We can just think of some trumped up charges and you're gone. And that sort of startled him because, after all, <laughs> KGB people are also human beings, and Geneva was and is a very nice posting. You know, uh, it's a very nice, clean town, very affluent. Uh, there are the mountains, there's forests, there's the lake, lovely lake. Uh, you can go skiing, what have you. And with that 
any attempt of Michiel to compromise me or to do odd things uh, ended. Uh, we remained in touch and he gave me some useful information now and then, but uh, no strange things anymore. Right. But I understand there was a, a, an exception, though, where he, he did ask you to do something for him. Yes, but... Uh, that was not something which could compromise me. But yeah. I had told him that I had worked for Amnesty International in the past. And um, at, at one of our meetings, he asked me, he said uh, uh, that Moscow, he didn't really specify who, but Moscow had received a letter from Amnesty International um, about a possible opening of an Amnesty International office in Moscow. Uh, I was flabbergasted when I heard that because, you know, Amnesty International had been harassing the Soviet authorities about the fate of political prisoners and abuse of psychiatry and what have you for decades. Um, so the, the point in time where Amnesty International could ask for an, to open an office in, in the Soviet Union was really revolutionary. But anyway, he told me... Uh, could you please tell them that it doesn't work this way? I mean, you can't write a letter and expect uh, things to happen. They should first have a meeting uh, on neutral ground with Fyodor Burlatsky. And Fyodor Burlatsky at the time was a very high-placed functionary uh, and, and basically uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's main troubleshooter in, in the field of human rights and, and other issues. Um, so, so I called... Uh, the International Secretariat in, of Amnesty in London um, and I, I talked with their legal advisor, uh, the late Sir Nigel Rodley and I, I told him about, you know, this Russian guy who I presume is an intelligence officer uh, told me this and that about the letter and there was a long silence at the other end of the line. He said, how on earth did you, do you know about this letter? It's highly confidential. Only I, the Secretary General, and our Secretary know about its existence. Well, I said, I'm sorry, I'm just acting as a, as a messenger um, for someone who I believe is a, is a KGB guy. Um, and this is their message. That's all. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to know more about that. And later I heard there had indeed been a meeting on neutral ground. And yes, there had been progress towards getting an office in Moscow. But it was a, a quite interesting thing because uh, the KG or Mikhail didn't ask me in person to do something for them. He just asked me to pass on a message and, and that was all. And I presume, I presumed at the time that I wasn't the only messenger that uh, Moscow's message to Amnesty International had gone through other channels as, as well, because, you know, why run the risk of doing it only through one channel, a Dutch journalist uh, in Geneva, and risk maybe the message getting distorted along the way or what have you. But I never heard anything about that anymore. Right. So they were sort of using you as like a back channel to send a message to Amnesty. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I, th I think that whole Amnesty International office debate was quite contentious in the Soviet Union as well because the KGB were against it and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were in favor. That is correct. I, I actually spoke at the, the Foreign Ministry in Moscow about this issue uh, with people of the Foreign Ministry who didn't really say the KGB was against, but they, they hinted at it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a little aftermath to this story, isn't there, in 91? That's true. I left Geneva um, in 90, early 1990, um, went on to become a correspondent first in East Berlin and then uh, moved to Prague. But I often came back to Geneva because I had many friends there. And one of these times, uh, I think it was in 1992, uh, I went back and stayed with a, a good friend. And within two days, the press guy of the American embassy or American permanent representation to the UN called me at his friend's home. I don't know how he knew I was there. That, that was miracle number one or mystery number one. Yeah. Um, and he invited me for lunch. And again, uh, business was done over coffee after lunch. And he, he said, 
you knew so many Soviet diplomats when you were working here. Could you make a list for us of those of among them who you believed were working for the KGB? I said, come on. <laughs> you know, I, I don't do such things. Um, the only thing that was interesting for me was, was their information correct or not? And then he became very angry. He was smiling. He had been smiling all along the lunch. But then he became, his face sort of changed and he became quite angry. I said, he told me, but you were in touch with the most important KGB guy in Geneva. And I, I thought to myself that, I said, this can't have been Mikhail, because he wasn't that clever or, or he didn't make a very important impression. And it turned out to be the press spokesman of the Soviet delegation uh, to the conflict on disarmament, the, the guys that did the chemical weapons negotiations, which I had consulted often to get, you know, uh, points of view, uh, news, what have you. And that Russian never asked me to do anything strange and never invited, invited me for lunch, for that matter. Um, it was just a, a business contact like you had so many at the UN. Um, and I, I, I told somewhat provocatively uh, this American, you know, if all the Russian diplomats were like him, you wouldn't have any, tr any problems. Uh, and he said, you know, again, uh, it was the, their most important agent. And then years later, courtesy of the internet, which in my time in Geneva didn't exist yet, but years later, I found out this, this uh, chemical weapons spokesperson had been one of 50 uh, uh, Soviet or Russian spies that were the first large groups that were collectively expelled as spies from the United States in 2001. Um, and thanks to the internet, uh, his name was on the on that list. So yes, he must have been quite important. Right, right. And I think you uh, found Mikhail as well via Google. I did, but nothing interesting. It, it turned out he uh, he had a job at the Russian embassy in Helsinki, Finland, and specialized in uh, uh, the work of the Arctic. Council, which is an international body dealing with uh, matters relating to the Arctic region. Um, but nowadays, he, uh, his name is gone from the internet. Um, so what, what were these KGB agents doing at the UN then? Uh, frankly speaking, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a, a, I wasn't and am not a counterintelligence specialist and had no idea exactly what they were doing. But obviously, every national delegation at the UN was trying to find out, for instance, negotiating positions of other parties, um, arms control, human rights, but also trade. Uh, the, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, GATT, later becoming the WTO, was quite important for everybody. Um, Michael did tell me that uh, at one point they would copy research files of the World Health Organizations at night in the, in the WHO building uh, simply to save money. Uh, you know, research is quite, can be quite expensive. Uh, so if you can save money by copying research uh, from a UN body, well, so much the better. Why they would do that at night is, a, uh, I don't really understand, but I'm not spying. <laughs> So they were using like the World Health Organization's photocopier to uh, duplicate these files. Yes, exactly. And it oh. was, but of course, saving money on files, but saving money on research. Yeah. Uh, back in the model. Land. Yeah, yeah. And I understand that you discovered in Oleg Gordievsky's 1995 biography um, why KGB did not ask for receipts in restaurants. Indeed, uh, Gordievsky writes, and he should know because he was very high in the KGB, um, that leaving the bill in a restaurant was sort of tradecraft for KGB agent because they thought that taking along the bill or the check or whatever you want to call it um, was not very chic, was not very cosmopolitan. Uh, you know, it was it was beyond them. So just leave the bill doesn't matter about expense accounts and things like that. Uh, behave in a modern way and le leave the bill. That was new to me. I only read this a few years ago. I didn't know that at the time. 
Well, it just goes to show how good you were at spotting um, tradecraft. Yeah, well, I didn't know it was tradecraft at the time. I probably didn't even know the word tradecraft, although I was an avid reader at the time of John Le Curry's uh, novels. But uh, the word tradecraft was not something I would use regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the other thing I quite liked is you discovering about the um, – you know, if a diplomat had been in physical contact with a foreigner, what they had to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a shame I didn't know that at the time. But again, like I said, uh, uh, there, there was no internet. And so your knowledge was much more limited than it is for journalists these days. Um, but someone knowledgeable told me that any Soviet diplomat who had been in physical contact with a foreigner uh, should come to the parent representation just across uh, the street from the UN um, at the end of the day and report this in person to a KGB or even to the uh, ambassador, actually. Um, because, obviously, uh, shaking hands is one thing, but when you shake someone someone's hand, you can also pass a microchip or what have you, a small slip of paper, uh, to the other person. So they were they were so uh, paranoid, I would say, uh, about their the activities of their own people, that they indeed forced uh, diplomats to, like children, to report to their ambassador at the end of the day. It's a shame I didn't know that at the time because I I could have waited in front of the embassy and and take pictures of lines of of diplomats coming to report, <laughs> but I didn't know that yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and the 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 other thing I found interesting was um, uh, the John Tower story, which I wasn't aware of. The Republican senator who was head of the U.S. uh, nuclear weapons negotiating team at the Start talks. Absolutely, Um, I I did go to the building now and then where these talks took place, at least the American uh, part of the of the the building, Um, and just. Uh, very close by uh, on the Rue de Lausanne uh, in Geneva, there was a, and still is, by the way, uh, the Mr. Pickwick Bar. Um, And when John Tower uh, uh, was nominated to be U.S. Secretary of Defense back in 1989, uh, shortly afterwards it popped up that he had been compromised by a female KGB operative um, the exact details of which <laughs> the, the compromise, uh, I don't know, but it must have been quite serious because um, there was a FBI investigation, there was a CIA investigation, um, there was a CIA report uh, about the event, and then the Senate rejected rejected his nomination uh, in, a, in a vote quite unprecedented. Um, now, female KGB operatives... In, the, in their jargon, are called swallows, like the bird, you know. Yeah. Um, and their main objective is, of course, to get diplomats into horizontal action, if you know what I mean. I and think then, we do know what you mean. And then make <laughs> pictures for, for later use as blackmail material. Yeah. 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 A little bit uh, different to handing an envelope over, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, the point, of course, is I was simply a correspondent at the UN, and uh, we presumed things like these happened, but you you never get to witness them firsthand. Um, in retrospect, I was very lucky to have had this contact with this presumed KGB guy, although he never showed me a membership card or you know a formal confirmation that he was KGB. He might have been... GRU, military intelligence, in retrospect, because he was so interested in chemical weapons, which is yeah. more a GRU thing. But then the GRU guy would never have asked me uh, about Amnesty International and stuff like that. So it was a quite interesting uh, episode in my journalistic career, um, which never repeated itself, I must say, uh, afterwards. But it was quite unique. Yeah, no, really interesting story to uh, speak to somebody who first hand was attempted to uh, be recruited as a um, 
source for uh, or an asset for Soviet intelligence. Yes, indeed. Um, now, you've also got another interesting story I wanted to touch on, because in, in 1987, you were one of the delegates who were invited to see a chemical weapons facility um, in the Soviet Union, weren't you? That's correct. Um, as a hobby, uh, or as a just journalistic hobby, one of my journalistic hobbies was covering the chemical weapons talks, which had been churning along for years in Geneva without much result until Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. Um, and then suddenly things started to move and the talks became quite interesting. I was basically the only or one of the only journalists covering the talks and you know meeting with the delegates and knowing the negotiators and the, the, the people, American, Russian, and what have you. Um, and... There came an invitation. Um, well, first of all, you must know that the Soviet, Soviet Union had always denied they had chemical weapons. They, they weren't there. And then suddenly in '87 they said, okay, we have them, and you, meaning uh, the Conference on Disarmament, can come and see them. So this was quite revolutionary. Um, and I was indeed the only journalist from the UN in Geneva who was invited to come along and cover this, this event. And it was extremely interesting, um, first of all, for me personally, because I had, I, although I had studied Russian, I had never been to the Soviet Union. Um, in my Amnesty International days, uh, it was discouraged to go there because there was too much risk of arrest or harassment. Um, and later, my career took me in other directions. So I could finally, uh, upon arriving in Moscow, I could finally order a bus ticket in the bus in Russian and buy cigarettes in the kiosk. Uh, I said, well, all those years of five years of studying Russian are finally paying off now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did they transport you from Moscow to the site? Because I think I understand it was somewhere on the Volga River. Yeah, it was about 800 kilometers from Moscow on the Volga River in the near, near Saratov, uh, the, the Shikhani chemical weapons compound. Um Delegations were flown with three uh, military Tupolevs um, to the site or to a military airfield near the site and then by bus to the site. It was, this was quite impressive uh, to begin with because the site was very well protected with you know lines of barbed wire. I think there were two or three cordons around the base. Um, and inside the base, well, we finally got to see... Uh, all the different munitions that the Soviet Union had at the time to deliver chemical warfare agents, ranging from hand grenades to uh, chemical warheads for SCUD ballistic missiles. Um, I mean, there were dozens, dozens of, of munitions. For me, this was extremely interesting. Yeah, and there's some great photos on your website. So we'll we're post links to your website so people can see those. Um, what so when you arrived at the base, how did they show you these these weapons? How how were they showing them to you? Well, well they had, they had made a an exhibition basically out in the open, um, where there were rows and rows of these munitions, but also uh, chemical decontamination uh, trucks. Uh, there were military tents. Uh, ever. And or interesting, I, I had been assigned a personal minder from the Soviet Ministry of Defense. Um, an oversized guy, I should say, uh, looked more like a, a boxer or something, or wrestler, <laughs> uh, who was at my, si at my side all the time. And uh, he accused us of being all spies and all that. So, uh, it was fun. But you were, you were able to take photos and take notes and look around. I mean, were there any areas they didn't let you go to? Or, no, or no, were no, you no, just. No, they wanted to show. And the interesting thing is that when we were in the buses driving towards the base, they told us no pictures, no photographs. And then when we arrived, they said, okay, well, you can take photographs. So every, everybody turned out to have a camera with him and made, was effortly making photographs. And it was a very interesting, <laughs> intelligent-related uh, accident or incident. Uh, I had almost seen everything and I've been in, I had been in every vehicle and I saw everything and took pictures. So I was having a chat and a cigarette with my minder. 
and um, we were standing in front of a chemical decontamination measurement truck, what have you. And up walks a diplomat I knew from Geneva. Uh, I think he may have been Australian or Canadian, something from the Anglophone world. He didn't see us. We were standing a bit on the side. And he was looking around, not in our direction, but in other directions. And he stuck out his arm, and in his hand he held a small camera, and he took pictures. <laughs> and it was so funny, because he could take pictures like, you know, we were all allowed to take pictures, but apparently this guy was so conditioned, so trained to take covert pictures with the camera hidden in his hand. And this Russian minder turned to me and said, what did I say about you all being spies? <laughs> and we had a <laughs> laugh ring. Yeah, yeah. So this minder you had, was he, you know, polite with you or was he, he was trying to intimidate you? No, he was polite. But yeah. he was a bit uh, insulting by claiming we were all spies, uh, which we weren't. There were several journalists there. I was the only one from Geneva, but there were, I think, about five or six correspondents from foreign correspondents from Moscow, and then a bunch of uh, Soviet uh, media. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you can understand it to some degree because it's not unknown for journalists to be used for spying, I suppose. But, but no, I'm, uh, I'm sure there, are, there have been journalists who are spies or were spies, but you know, these were you know pure sheaves yeah. of Reuters and BBC, whatever. You. Yeah, um, yeah. And I was just a simple Dutch correspondent from from Geneva, um, oh. and then uh, the the visit was split in two days. And overnight, we stayed in a quite luxurious cruise ship on the Volga, um, called the Yuri Andropov. I still remember, with excellent <laughs> dinner and all that, um, and more press conferences by the Soviets, uh, which was okay. And for me, it was funny because I knew several of these high-placed Soviet chemical weapons experts uh, from my days in Geneva uh, because I'd, I had interviewed or seen them there. Uh, so it was funny to see them in their own uh, context, in their own habitat, so to speak. Uh, quite interesting. And because I, I was in a unique position, at least for Dutch media, they had reserved... Uh, at least half an hour of radio for me on the Sunday morning, which was exceptional, exceptionally long, half an hour for any radio journalist. So I, I had prepared a broadcast having, you know, clips on cassettes, on cassettes uh, already. Because they had told me, yes, you, sure, you can file a story uh, to the Netherlands, no problem. So, so I went to the communications tent and said, hello, uh, in Russian. I'm here to file my uh, story uh, for radio, for Dutch radio. He, and the, the soldier, and you know, I said, foul to whom? I said, foul to the Netherlands. Can't be done, he said. I said, wait a minute, your ministry assured me that it was possible. Well, the ministry can say anything, but it's not possible. You can, I can make a connection to Moscow for you, but that's all. And I had to think, oh my oh Lord, there's my radio station in Holland waiting for my stuff. What to do? So I asked a guy to call uh, a friend of mine who was a correspondent in Moscow, and I asked her to pass on the message to the Netherlands that, unfortunately, there was no connection possible to from Vigani at the Volga. Hmm. Um, so that was the end of it. <laughs> right, right. And did you did you carry out any interviews there? Uh, record any interviews? I did, yes, and I recorded all the, the briefings. Uh, yeah, I interviewed, obviously, the, the Dutch negotiator um, uh, from Geneva, the American one, the Russian one. Uh, I think that was it. And, well, several Soviet military people. Um, but the interesting thing was that uh, the Americans said they were not very satisfied because the Soviets hadn't shown everything. Uh, you must... Uh, I must stress that these munitions they showed were obviously empty. There was no nerve gas inside the bombs or mustard gas or what have you. But the Americans had expected the Soviets to admit they had binary chemical weapons, which is, you know, uh, 
ammunition in which the in which two components are kept separately until they are launched and then they mix and then they form a nerve gas. Mm. Um, and they had expected to see that, but as it was, it was very uh, important, uh, what you call a confidence building measure to show these weapons and to admit they had them. Um, and indeed, after that, the negotiations, negotiations in Geneva picked up speed and uh, led within a few years to the Chemical Weapons Convention, which was a highly complicated uh, treaty, still is, uh, which entered into force in 90... No, it was signed in 1993. Yeah, it, it must have been very difficult for the Soviet army to accept having to show what had been top secret not so long ago to effectively people from NATO. To the enemy, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. But such is life for the military. I mean, if the political bosses decide to change course and... Uh, engage in, in new ventures with, with the uh, counterparts, uh, so be it, and you have to follow them. Yeah. Um, later, I found that one of the most interesting people at the Shihani visit, um, and indeed, I, I had seen and interviewed him back in, in Geneva, uh, was uh, General Kutsevich, uh, who later uh, died mysteriously, uh, after reportedly or allegedly having been involved in uh, providing Syria with uh, nerve gas uh, information or indeed and or nerve gas materials. Um, and he died mysteriously in a helicopter incident, accident of some sort. Um, but at the time he was just the number two in command of the Soviet Chemical Weapon Corps. For, so for me he was, he was an interesting guy, but uh, I must admit, these military, when you interview them, they don't really say anything interesting. But that goes for military all over the world, unless uh, they're very high placed, you know, commanders in chief. Yeah. But routine military, routinely military don't say much. They don't like journalists. And they just, you know, say prepared text, basically. Y yeah. Yeah, and you say that the 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 obviously the warheads were empty, but did they show you at all how potent some of the chemical weapons were? No, not well. What they did show uh, was the effectiveness of a mobile decontamination or neutralization unit, in which you can load uh, a chemical weapons munition and neutral neutralize it through hydrolysis. Uh, to show that uh, that uh, it was real, first of all, they, they made us all wear gas masks and we were put behind a plexiglass screen. Um, they took a syringe and uh, extracted some fluid from a bomb um, and then went on to inject this fluid into a rabbit, a live one, um, which subsequently died a horrible death, shaking all over. So yes, it was indeed nerve gas. Then the bomb went into this neutralization unit, and after an hour or so, or two hours, uh, they took it out again. Uh, again, uh, took a syringe, extracted fluid from the bomb, injected another rabbit, and uh, lo and behold, it, it survived. Nothing happened. Right. I mean, how, how did you feel when they said look we want you to put on these masks because i mean that that implies that this experiment could go wrong well i think this there was a highly theoretical risk of sarin it was a, a sarin filled bomb of sarin escaping from this bomb and spilling off to the area where we were all sitting uh, but first, first of all they had this this uh, plexiglass separation uh, wall so to speak uh, to protect us, and then we, we all were, had to wear a gas. Well, we didn't have to wear it at the time. We had to keep it ready. And before this experiment started, we all had to test our gas mask in a gas tent, which brought to me memories back from my army days where we also had to do that. You know, you fill a tent with tear gas and then have everybody check if their gas mask fits all right. 
because if it leaks, uh, the tear gas uh, takes hold of you. Uh, but I think that's what just just an insurance policy uh, in case something very strange would happen. Yeah. 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 And uh, lastly, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier as well that you, you served in the, in, in the Dutch army. What, what was your, your role there? Um, I was a, a gunnery sergeant, uh, conscripted, uh, of course. Yeah. Um, and my task was to operate a computer with which you direct a, uh, artillery battalion. Right. To make sure that the, the shots arrived on target yeah in time yeah uh, and for me it was interesting because i was based uh, after basic training in the netherlands i was uh, uh, based at a, a dutch brigade in uh, west germany um, and which where my interest for the soviet union and east germany <laughs> was was vastly increased because they were so close by and what what were you? I mean, when you were in the army, what what was what were you told about East Germany and the Soviet Union as as far as um, you know why you were there and why you know why the army was there? Hardly anything. Um, my job was very technical. Uh, my task was to eliminate advancing Warsaw Pact units. Uh, based on on uh, direction given by a forward observer, so the forward observer would call me on the radio and designate the target, uh, give a target description, uh, map coordinates, I, and which I then entered into my computer, and lo and behold, results came after a minute or two. Right, but w- there was there was no ideological indoctrination or, or anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and did you during that time? Did you were you taken on a trip up to the the border to actually see what it was like? No, I wasn't. Nor was my unit. Uh, but these days, I follow w- websites of uh, army uh, veterans, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, um, that was quite normal for Dutch conscripts to be taken to the Iron Curtain have a have a look. Mind you, not in uniform, not to cause any problems there. Right. Just to have a, have a look at at, uh, at the border, just yeah. like they went to, for instance, the Bergen Belsen concentration camp uh, to commemorate what happened there. Uh, no, there, there was no, there were there was no. Maybe in training we got to see a movie about the Soviet threat, probably, but I don't really remember. But that's prob- probably. And, and was this the uh, the early eighties that you were in the Dutch army? Make that the early seventies. Early seventies. <laughs> I was just because uh, you know it, the Dutch army is an interesting army as far as NATO is concerned because of the conscription. I've seen these photos of uh, some of the uh, the strange, not strange hair, but longer hairstyles in the Dutch army. Oh, I was a long-haired sergeant. Uh, the year nineteen seventy-one, when I entered military service, was the year where. Um, uh, they stopped cutting or making cutting your hair obligatory. So all the young guys, like myself, we went into the army with long hair and kept it long. Um, and, well, that was it. But uh, I do remember that our capabilities were, were quite good. Um, I, I first took pride in when there was an international artillery competition with uh, our British and American neighbors, uh, we won in terms of being able to deliver artillery fire in time and and on target. Um, Why did we win? I think because the average education level of the conscript was so high compared to American and especially British troops um, that it gave us a big advantage. Right. And there was no problem... Uh, I mean, everybody did what they had to do. There was no problem with motivation. Uh, people were, weren't really enthusiastic about it because most saw it as a waste of time, but they did what they had to do. Yeah. And how long was your national service for? As a as a non-commissioned officer? Yeah. 18 months. 18 months. Okay. Okay. And then did you get recalled back 
at various periods to keep I, the training I, going. I could have been, but I think one or two years after I left the army, I got a, a letter saying that my war destination had been cancelled. So that was it. Right. So they trained you for 18 months and then you no, you weren't kept on the reserve. They, they train you for about six to eight months. Yeah. Then you are sent to a, uh, a ready unit uh, for your actual service. There, there's no more right. training. Well, there's no more real, really important training uh, after that. Yeah. It's just practice. And we have further photos, videos and information on this episode in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get one of those Cold War Conversations coasters help keep us on the air, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.